So I wanted to follow on um, with, with her, uh, the theme song that the question you presented were <coughs> about, um, which is what makes it sense of data, how we uh, situate data into um, the kind of post enlightenment condition, where it's not about the idea that we can um, generate data, but that we can use it to inform action. So of course the the idea of the Enlightenment was that information would lead, lead to action. Right? And uh, now we know that that's not a direct coupling. So how do we take that information, make sense of it, or as Flora said, make knowledge with it, and um, think with it, um, and work with it, and use it to reimagine our relationship to natural systems, and to meet the challenges we in the 21st century. Uh, so I wanted to start off actually with um, the, a, a visualization that I did uh, a while ago on um, let's see, let's see, uh, called the half-life ratio, which took the um, tremendous rise um, of assistive reproductive technology, a health phenomena that has all sorts of craziness built into it. Did you know that um, infertility is not treated, is not covered by insurance, but um, Viagra is um, it's one of the um, marvelous ways in which our health industries reflect our, our values. But looking at um, assistive reproductive technology, you will actually, it's an interesting case study. So the half-life ratio actually looks at the market that demand for over and the market demand for sperm. Um, and of course, there's actually equal demand. About a third of infertility issues are male-related, a third are female-related, and a third are unknown. So the market demand is, is equal. However, the market price, one type of donor comes out about um, $38,000 down per viable um, uh, cell, and the other type of donor comes up about six cents up. Um, but of course, the amount of uh, tissues in grams, if you do you know, what's mostly called a cost benefit analysis, a quantitative risk analysis, uh, with the data that's available, um, the amount of tissue in grams, of course, is much more um, uh, produced. The labor costs from one sort of donor versus the other sort of donor um, uh, are about 25,000 to one. The active uh, donation is the uh, medical costs, of course, for the procedure, pre-procedure, post-procedure, um, the prior investment, um, the window of opportunity, um, the health risks, which are of course the short-term, long-term, and unknown risks associated um, and primarily borne by one type of donor and not the other type of donor, and then the risk of future litigation, which of course is actually borne by females twice as much as, um, as uh, male uh, sperm donors, interestingly. Things like um, people uh, going to court to reveal identities and surrogates and various things. And of course the contractual differences are interesting one type of donor, the, the contracts are typically in the language of transaction and exchange, and the other type of donor, the, the, uh, the contracts are in the language of donation. Um, and you probably can tell which type of donor um, comes off economically uh, in a very different situation. So what we see is these very new technologies, assistive reproductive technologies, which have risen in the um, next, in the last 20 years, reproducing some very familiar, very old gender inequity. And that's hard to see. It's hard to see, um, it's hard to make sense of, it's hard to um, uh, think through. Um, so I don't want to go into another old project that's um, uh, been a tremendous challenge <coughs> to make sense of. This is called the One Trees Project, and just quickly, it's a it's actually about 100 trees that are genetically identical that are planted in pairs around the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so they're all, all clones, are all genetically identical. Massive, sort of, what's the, what would be the twin um, triplet, or triplet, or 100, yeah. they're 100, 100. Um, yeah. um, anyway, they're planted in pairs, so you can see the within pair difference and the between pair difference. And over the last 10 years, um, because they're um, genetically identical, they've rendered the environmental differences to which they're exposed. 
So we take a multi-parameter, highly complex environmental, irreducibly complex environmental condition, like the megametropolis of San Francisco Bay Area, and try and make sense of it with these little probes. Of course, there's much other data to make sense of it with, uh, air quality data, and how that affects tree growth, um, soil conditions, all the um, precipitation, all the weather information that you can try and make sense of what are the um, quiet spectacle of environmental transformations that we're all actually living through. Um, and here's one example that I think has been very telling for me. This is the, the pair of trees on Valencia, um, that uh, on 22nd, actually, they're on 22nd at Valencia. Um, and you can see the difference in the girth. And uh, you can see, you know, they have the same solar expo exposure. They have this, you know, they're like, genetically identical. And this one though is like, you know, they can't even see that they're even similar, right, when you're there. They're so radically different. And can you make sense of that? Looking at all the data, it's about the same weather conditions, same air conditions, same. Um, and it was actually the um, construction worker across the road that helped me make sense of this one, um, which he saw me going there a few times and measuring them, looking at them, stomping around. I mean, one of the issue, one of the things I had was that with the water, that they were exposed to more water. <laughs> Interestingly, in San Francisco Bay Area, the, um, the, the pipes are all um, terracotta in an earthquake area. I don't know why. So they're all cracked. They're all leaking all everywhere, and they're all subsidizing the urban forest, which is great, right? But it, it doesn't actually mean that one of them got into the water main and the other one didn't, because they're both so what's going on? So this, uh, this guy told me to look behind the trees at the structures behind. And behind the big one is a Victorian, a classic Victorian house. Behind the little one is a, um, as a 1950s circa um, structure. And he said, well, you know, that, that's your explanation. What? He said, well, you know what happened between those two, the Victorian and this 1950s structure? The 1901 earthquake. So that means that changed foundation laws, or building code, and how foundations were built. And so this small one has probably been cut off in a sort of a massive bonsai, and has no access to the subsoil in the way that the one beside the Victorian does. I, it seems the most plausible um, explanation to me, and it was made sense of not by the soil scientists or the, you know, the boundary layer um, examination of the particulates and the particulate loading on the on the leaves, or, but by a construction worker who was making sense um, with the resources that he had to make sense with, right? And that's what I think is a powerful way for us to understand there is no shortage of data on uh, environmental data um, and urban forestry in the, um, certainly in the San Francisco Bay Area, which has been a real hotspot for it. Um, but actually, making sense of it actually depends on each one of us drawing on our diverse expertise and diverse resources. And that's actually the condition of an irreducibly, irreducibly multi-parameter, complex socio-ecological system in which we all work and, um, and, uh, I don't know, I don't know after all that. So, um, so I wanted to um, actually go back to uh, something about mobility, which is something we generate a great deal of information about in our urban context. And there's certainly a great need to think through how we might reimagine our urban mobility. Um, and I actually, you know, I run something called the Environmental Health Clinic, as Mark mentioned, and I set up field offices. Um, and this was a field office in Belgium that I set up uh, in the middle of a um, roundabout in order to illustrate, uh, to sort of situate and embed us uh, the impatient of myself in the uh, air quality conditions, but also in this very familiar icon of headless social movement, the anarchistic organization of the of the uh, traffic <coughs> roundabout, which of course is very radically different from the red light traffic intersection, which delegates the capacity to make a decision about whether it's safe to go to some remote authority. Uh, and here, of course, it depends on each one of us making an intelligent decision, and you get higher throughput and fewer accidents. And they're just not as popular because they're not quite so uh, space. Um, they take up more space than your traditional um, uh, roundabout. But it's a, it's a it's a useful icon to remember. Headless social movement can and does work um, in the um, in the ways that 
who has the information, therefore who can be making the decisions on our behalf, is often played out in public discourse. Um, so this is a, another recent project that's in development called the Bike Messenger, in which the wheels are um, actually um, uh, equipped with LEDs that um, provide a point of view display. So as the wheels go, get to about five miles an hour, they stabilize into an image. These images, a lot of them are pie charts, so we call them occupies. Um, that, um, uh, and the first one that we've been working on is the <coughs> traffic fatality. So it's uh, geolocated uh, information where as you ride through your bike through the intersection, it displays the traffic fatalities at that intersection, right? Situated information at that point. Um, and, and the next intersection different. Or the, um, if you go down the riverside path, it shows the um, organisms that inhabit the waterfront that are typically not seen, that, that appear in the, in the um, um, so it's a, a, a platform for if you will, civic media where um, it's distributed, geolocated, and real time. Um, and it's actually been an interesting project for me to work on because you see, you see the wonderful thing about a cyclist as opposed to this kind of information being on a taxi or a bus or, or um, some other form of public transportation or, um, is of course you stop the, the cyclist for being so interesting. What's that about? You know, what's going on? But it, it can and may well initiate um, uh, in, in, um, oh, another thing is that they display the um, emissions from local um, manufacturing facilities. But um, the question is then what, right? What is it that you, it's still data spectatorship, if you will. It's still kind of just thinking about, oh, well, that's depressing, isn't it? <laughs> oh, seven people killed at this intersection. Interesting to know that 60% uh, of traffic fatalities are not cyclists, not motorcyclists, not even combined uh, um, motorcyclists or people on the suicide seat or pedestrians. Right? Um, and where that happens and why that happens. So how do you couple that kind of information and that situated, situated local display into action, into something that people can do? So there's a couple of projects in a, an exhibition called Up To You in Civic Action in the Noguchi Museum, which was just closed um, a couple of days ago, but a version of it will open up um, on May 13th at the Socrates. Um, when we built a bicycle bridge, a micro-infrastructure, we've also <coughs> proposed to the local high school a, um, a bicycle Ferris wheel, which you get 10 times the storage for the, the bicycles in front of the high school where they Actually, they don't cycle, they don't have the means, but it becomes and would be, provide a safe place to store bicycles and, and celebrate the, um, the use of bicycles and further build out the infrastructure for bicycles beyond the bike lane. Because public discourse, I think, is being trapped into this idea of um, bike lanes as some radical transformative thing, when of course they aren't. Um, so, um, so that, and another analysis that I did um, for a project called X Airport was to uh, look at the opportunity the FAA has provided in actually creating a whole new class of aircraft um, called the Light Sport Aircraft, LSA, and the fact that now you can get a pilot's license in, um, in about um, uh, 20 hours, so by uh, Wednesday you could be qualified as a pilot, which gives us the kind of capacity to reimagine our um, possibilities of flying, um, or why flight is the single most damaging thing we do as individuals um, in terms of the ecological footprint. If you look at a systems analysis, what's interesting is that much of the research and engineering is on the, the thrust systems and um, the, uh, the, in a commercial um, airliner, the catering services have a bigger ecological footprint than the um, trust systems, but uh, by far the biggest impact is the, with, uh, is the landing infrastructure that we build on weapons that we know are biodiversity hotspots and critical ecosystems for sequestering CO2 and for degrading the industrial contaminants and for nurseries for aquatic organisms and for protect protecting the terrestrial organisms. And so um, uh, I built out the, um, something called a wet landing which was a, a new uh, way to land, uh, wet landing as opposed to a dry landing. You never have to level a wet landing for these new planes, which I'll just give you a quick peek at. And this is one of them that I'm 
trying to finish off the things and maybe I won't. Um, because I want to get to this idea of what we can do and how how we can reimagine moving. We had to refurnish the um, the wetlands so that we can understand, retrieve them from the swamps of the public imagination, think <coughs> that you know, green spaces are these toxic turf or lawns, and instead actually um, high performing um, microecologies of, of wetland systems that provide thousands of tons of environmental services. But we have to refurnish them, we have to re-inhabit them, we have to place ourselves in them differently. Um, and so these are some new furniture, the head down display, the head way down display, and the bird study, um, which you can see here. Uh, and these actually are informed by, um, which I wasn't able to pull up, the data on um, uh, neuromuscular innovation, the head neck shoulder syndrome, which is the most commonly treated um, neuromuscular disorder that comes from our work styles and, um, you know, we've radically transformed our, our information technologies and yet we still work in Starbucks and in offices and home offices as Ellen <coughs> uh, mentioned and we haven't reimagined how we can place ourselves in, in the environment. Um, for those of you who've lost the wonder of flight or need a prosthetic for the imagination um, to explore the possibilities of flight, um, there's this strap-on flight simulator that you can use, uh, looks like this, um, where you can convert your car into a portable wind tunnel um, and, uh, and, and try out different biomimetic wings. Um, and then, of course, you can strap on your 16-foot um, wingspan wings and uh, practice your wet landings. Um, or as we in, they did in collaboration with Usman Hupp at um, Toronto, you can um, get your autopilot license um, and fly through uh, downtown uh, Toronto on these wings. Um, and I'll just finish with showing you a little um, bit of this. Um, these wings which allow you to um, feel that these are zip lining wings where you're not actually doing this for terror or for, you know, um, <coughs> Speed, but for the gentle phenomena of lift that you feel as you're um, strapped in and taking off. And what I think this um, provided is a spectacle, um, of a kind of a, a shared public memory, if you will, um, of a possible future. Right? That the idea that we can radically reimagine our urban mobility and think about fast, inexpensive, radically inexpensive emissionless forms of transportation. Um, has been um, taken up by the Zipline to School Initiative, um, which uh, um, you know, is a thrilling and safe way to get to, safer than walking or riding to get to school, but also um, allows us to start to reimagine how we might take the, the you know, food distribution system that we've built among our city, for instance, where Tomcat Bakery, 76 trucks every morning, delivers fresh artisanal airy bread um, around uh, New York City and plumes of diesel fumes to Long Island City residents. 7,000 deliveries a day from Fresh Direct. Um, those plumes of diesel fumes concentrated in Long Island City. Um, and we could, of course, easily, for actually less than the cost of the maintenance cost of one biodiesel truck for one year, build a um, a zip line system to distribute food. Um, so these are, um, as I said, a, a, a ways to make sense, to rethink the data that we have on our traffic fatalities, our environmental data, to situate them in a context in which we can draw on the distributed intelligence of many people with diverse capacities, diverse interests, diverse expertise, and start to really reimagine more radically how we might um, redesign our relationship to natural systems. Thank you.